Good morning and welcome to worship at the Wallace Presbyterian Church in Wallace, North Carolina. Welcome all who are here in person and those who are watching our live stream. It's good to be with you as we worship. This is the first Sunday in the season of Lent. Lent is a period of 40 days leading up to our celebration of Easter. If you get the calendar out and count the days between this past Wednesday and Easter Sunday, you'll get more than 40 days. But the Sundays in, East, in Lent are not counted. Um, each Sunday is considered a little resurrection of the Lord. But the 40 days remind us of 40 days of Noah, the 40 days of the, the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Moses on the mountain, Elijah on the mountain, Jesus in the wilderness. It's a time of um, introspection, a time of confession, a time of repentance, a time of preparation as we prepare to celebrate this resurrection of our Lord and Savior on Easter Sunday. I'm glad all of you are here today to be with us. And speaking of Easter Sunday, um, you may have received a survey or a link for a survey. We really appreciate if you would respond um, about whether or not you're planning at this point to come to worship on Easter Sunday. We realize it's a few weeks away, but we have to make our plans accordingly. And we need to hear from you, even if you aren't planning. If you know that you won't be here, that's helpful information for us as we make our plans. The deadline will be next Sunday, and the link will be sent out a couple more times between now and then. Thank you for helping us make our decisions. Elder Fred Burroughs is leading worship with me today. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Please join me in the opening sentences. The season of Lent is the faithful journey to salvation. Salvation, salvation that will be found beyond the cross in an empty tomb. We remember that God has already saved us. That God brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and brought us in safety to the other side of the sea. We recognize that God is saving us now, that God sends us into the wilderness of Lent, filled with the Spirit to gather and to guide. We celebrate that God will save us, that God will give us signs and wonders to inspire and encourage us along the way. Come, let us begin this journey of Lent. Let us follow Christ to the cross. Our first hymn this morning is number 726, Will You Come and Follow Me? And we'll sing the first two verses. season of Lent, we are invited to consider how we live as followers of Jesus Christ, to look at our decisions and our actions straight on, to hold them up against the example of Christ, and to make amends. In this time of prayer together, both spoken and silent, let us look at our lives 
as we pray to the one who says, follow me. Please join me in our unison prayer, our silent prayers, our assurance of pardon. Let us pray. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. In the blazing light of your love, our failings are illuminated. Our failure to give, our failure to love, our failure to follow, our failure to serve, our failure to be the people you would have us be. You know our nature and you know our failings. Lord, forgive us and renew us. Enfold us in your arms that we might daily know your forgiveness and healing love. Lord Jesus, hear our prayers. God's love is sure and steadfast, always providing a way out, a way through, a way back to God. Through the waters of baptism, we have died with Christ and are raised with Him. With gratitude and faith, we will walk the way of Christ. Let us sing God's praises for His mercy in our lives. to all the children in the church to everyone else. I want to tell you a little story and then I have some pictures to show you. Many years ago, I used to like to run. I, I, I could run. I can't do that anymore. And I ran every day and I loved to run. And when Miss Nancy and I were in school up in Richmond, Virginia, I would run every day and I found out about a race at a park nearby, and so I signed up to run in the race. And a friend from school used to want to run with me, and he was a nice guy, but he just couldn't run very well. He couldn't run very fast, and it was, he couldn't keep up. So we would run every once in a while, and he said, are you going to run in that race? And I, I couldn't lie to him. I said, yeah, I'm going to run in that race. He said, well, I'm going to go with you. I said, okay. So we got there, and there were all these people, you know, getting ready to run the race. And um, we noticed that there were a bunch of photographers and news cameras there, which I thought was kind of interesting. And Gary, that was my friend's name, he came over to me and he said, Phil, the mayor of Richmond is going to run in the race with us, with us, like he came because we were there. And sure enough, the mayor of Richmond was there, and you know the reporters were interviewing him and everything. And Gary said to me, "When when the race starts, I'm gonna get out in front and I'm gonna run as fast as I can." And I said, "Well, if you do that, you're not gonna finish the race." And he said, "Well, I don't care about finishing the race." He said, "I figure that they'll film the beginning of the race, and I'll be on TV tonight." And I said, well, Gary, whatever you want to do, okay? I'm not going to do that. Well, sure enough, the race started, and Gary took off, and all the people were following him, and Gary went the wrong way. (laughs) And a bunch of people followed him, and they went the wrong way. And the volunteers in the race were, no, go this way, go this way. And, And to top it off, he wasn't on the news that night. So I brought some pictures because I want to think about that story for a minute. This first picture is just the picture. This isn't us running that race. It's just a picture of people running a race. But notice that one person's out in front and everybody else is following that person. And um, Gary was kind of embarrassed that he led the people the wrong way. Have you ever played the game Follow the Leader? Maybe you have. 
at school or when you're playing with your friends and you know you get to be the leader and everybody has to go where you go and that's a big responsibility because you have to um, take them where it's safe but you might make them climb over this or that or go around the corner or whatever but you know the rule is of the game if you're the leader you get to take people where you want to take them and everybody has to follow well, I thought this was a cute picture too. So there's a follow the leader of a mama duck and her babies following along behind her. But you know, that's because she's protecting them and she's going to take them where they need to go. And then here's a little drawing of somebody playing follow the leader and they're making sure they go because they're putting their hands on each other's shoulders. Well, you know, Jesus... When he called his disciples, he said, come, follow me. And I will lead you and I'll show you where to go. And the story in the Bible says that Simon and Andrew and James and John, they were fishermen and they got up and they followed Jesus. And then some other people followed Jesus. And then a lot of people followed Jesus. But you know, when I think about that story about Jesus, sometimes people that said, I'll follow you, ended up kind of being like Gary. And I'm not, I'm not making fun of Gary, but he went off the wrong way. And a lot of people went after him. And they had to come back and get on the right path to finish the race. And I think sometimes we do that. We say, oh, Jesus, I'll follow you. But then we go where, you know, we go the way we want to go and we don't follow Jesus. But Jesus says, come and follow me. And it's like, follow the leader. We follow Jesus and we can trust that he's going to take us where we need to go. Might be hard sometimes, but he will watch out for us. Kind of like that mama duck showing her little ducklings where to go and to take care of them. Come follow me and I will take care of you, and you can be my disciples. And Jesus still says that to us today. Come, follow me. Let's have a prayer together. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that Jesus is our leader. We pray that we will follow him the way he wants us to go. Sometimes it's hard to follow him. Sometimes we think we know a better way. Help us to realize that when we follow Jesus, we will always go the best way. We pray in his name. Amen. Please join me in our prayer for illumination as we get ready to hear God's word read and proclaimed. Let us pray together. Holy God, reveal your presence to us this day as we journey this path with your Son. Through all of life's trials and tribulations, your word sustains us for the journey ahead. Send your Spirit upon us that we might listen, discern, and take heart. Be near us this day, and may your word with us stay and dwell with us forevermore. Amen. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 16. Listen for the word of the Lord. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. 
I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it, that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have obtained. Quite a while we've been, we've been hearing from the Gospel of Mark. During the season of Lent, we're going to uh, hear from the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke's Gospel, Luke has 24 chapters. Not quite halfway through, at the end of chapter 9, where we're going to read from today, Jesus turns toward Jerusalem. And it takes him 10 chapters, almost half the gospel, to get to Jerusalem. And we'll hear that story on Palm Sunday. This is a major turning point in the gospel. And um, from here on out, the, the emphasis is on Jesus coming, suffering, and death. If you look at a map of the Holy Land to get from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south, if you draw a straight line, um, that would seem to be the, the best way to go. Um, in the days of Jesus, people traveling, Jews traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem would head east and cross the Jordan River and then drop down south and then cross back over the Jordan River. Uh, it made the trip longer, but it helped them avoid Samaria because the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. Interestingly, our story begins with Jesus going into a Samaritan village. And in the next chapter of Luke's Gospel, Jesus tells a parable about what it means to be a good neighbor, and the hero of that story is the Samaritan. So I invite you to listen for God's Word as the introduction today for this Luke and Lent, a uh, journey to Jerusalem, chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, Jesus said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? 
This is the first line of today's opening and closing hymn. Sounds like a pleasant invitation, and it certainly leaves you the option to say, no, I won't. The subtitle of today's hymn in the hymnal is The Summons. That sounds much less ambiguous. A summons, from a legal point of view, is in order to appear before a judge or a magistrate. And the summons that you receive will include a specific amount of time you have to respond to the summons. You are required to appear. You don't have the option to say no. I guess you do. But you know what I mean. You're supposed to be there. A month ago, we heard the story from Mark's gospel about Jesus calling Simon, Andrew, James, and John to be his first disciples. Follow me, he said, and I will make you fish for people. And even though follow me is in the imperative mood, it sounds more like an invitation. Simon, Andrew, James, and John, they didn't have to accept Jesus' summons, but they did. And remember, immediately they left their nets and their boats and they followed him. Today's hymn, and we're singing the same one at the beginning and the end, Will You Come and Follow Me? The summons was written by John Bell and Graham Mall for the Iona community off the coast of Scotland. It was used at the conclusion of a year-long mission by young people in the Scottish church who were sent to live in impoverished areas of Scotland. The young people lived on welfare payments and they served in very difficult circumstances. At the end of their mission, a farewell ceremony was held in the house where the youth had been living for the year. John Bell and Graham Mall originally wrote this song just for that one occasion, but the song became very popular, very meaningful, and began to be published in different hymnals. The first four verses of the hymn are the voice of Christ, extending the invitation and the summons, will you come and follow me? The fifth verse is the voice of the one who is called, Lord, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. According to one history of the song, in this song, the call to service is one that is transformational. When we accept Christ's call to come and be where God is already, our lives are shaped by that experience. And that history of the hymn notes that the last line of each verse echoes the mutual nature of how God works in us and through us, and how through God we find our living, our moving, and our very being. So in that history, there was that one line that caught my attention. When we accept Christ's calling to come and be where God already is. That's the meaning of today's gospel story on this first Sunday of Lent. And that summons to come and be where God is already stands in sharp contrast to how we so often ask, how we so often expect, how we sometimes even demand that God come to where we are already and to stay there with us. The season of Lent is often called a journey. And for the next seven weeks, we will make our way through the Gospel of Luke, following Jesus on his journey to Jerusalem. The journey begins as Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. This journey is not a pleasure cruise. It's not a day trip. It's not a sightseeing tour. Jesus is determined to go to Jerusalem. And as I said in Luke's gospel, it takes him 10 chapters, almost half the gospel, to get to Jerusalem. And someone has noted that Jesus' road to Jerusalem determines everything else that he does. When Jesus accepts and sets his face to go to Jerusalem, it means he accepts God's summons in his life. He accepts God's will for his life. And then Jesus turns to us. 
and asks, will you come and follow me? Imagine that you're planning a big celebration for a significant event, a wedding reception, an anniversary party, a retirement send-off. You're excited. You send out the invitations and you ask, will you come? Well, typically, the RSVP will ask if you plan to attend, and if so, how many are coming? And you usually need to respond yes or no by a specific date. If you're RSVPing, a simple yes or no should be sufficient. But you know, if you can't attend and you're really close to the host, you might offer an explanation. You know, that's the weekend of Joe's graduation, or we're going out of town for my mother's memorial service, or, or something else. And while disappointed, the host will probably graciously accept your regrets. Imagine, though, if you are the host and you got this RSVP, I'll come to your party if I don't have anything better to do that weekend. That would be pretty offensive, wouldn't it? Well, the analogy isn't 100% accurate, but maybe it helps us think about the urgency and the importance of the summons of Jesus. Follow me. When you get an invitation to a wedding or a party in the mail, you typically have several weeks to reply. Jesus' summons requires an answer right now. And that's at the heart of what Jesus says to those three would-be disciples. Follower number one, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus, in, in effect, asks, do you know what you're saying? Do you know what kind of journey I'm going on? Follower number two, well, Jesus, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus says, and doesn't this sound harsh? Well, my invitation is more important than that. Follower number three, I will follow you, Lord, but let me go home and say goodbye. And Jesus says, if you look back, you'll miss the opportunity. I'm moving ahead. These are prime examples of what are known as the hard sayings of Jesus. Yeah, it might be easier to answer the summons if you're called away from less than desirable circumstances. But in his commentary on this gospel story, Fred Craddock says the call to discipleship is not set against weak and flimsy excuses, but against primary personal and family obligations attending to your own comfort, taking care of your parents, love of your family. He writes, loyalty to Jesus takes precedence over the best, not the worst, of our human priorities. And that's why this story from Luke's gospel is so appropriate as we begin our Lenten journey with Jesus to Jerusalem. As the announcement about Lent and last week's bulletin read, the season of Lent is a time of self-reflection and examination in preparation for the celebration of the resurrection of the Lord at Easter. It is the power of the resurrection on the horizon ahead that draws us into repentance toward the cross and the tomb. In other words, the season of Lent is a time for us to examine our lives and to confess how often we respond to Jesus' summons by saying something like, I'll follow you, Jesus, but dot, dot, dot. Or someone said in Bible study this week, we have to face up to the truth that we all too often say, I'll follow you, Lord, but on my terms, not your terms. Here's how a blogger states the same thing. Does Jesus make a noticeable difference in your life? Or to put it another way, does the grace, mercy, and love of God made incarnate in Jesus Christ trump our plans and shape our lives? Or do we shape our faith to fit the lives we already planned? So to use the image 
of the day. How do we RSVP the summons of Jesus in our lives? In my reading this week, I found these words that I went home and I wrote down in my quote journal. They are a good description of our Lenten journey, actually of our entire journey of discipleship. And the quote says, we never stop asking Dietrich Bonhoeffer's question, who is Jesus Christ for us today? To which we may add the qualifiers in our work, in our politics, and in our relationships. Who is Jesus Christ for us today? The word of grace in today's gospel lesson is that we aren't on the journey by ourselves. Jesus doesn't summon us to discipleship in ministry and then say, well, good luck, you're on your own. I hope it works out okay in the end. No, Jesus says, follow me. And when we RSVP in good faith, we can be assured that as our hymn says, in your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show, thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. The most challenging part to me of Jesus' summons in this story is the last verse when he says, no one who puts a hand to a plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And that sounds a lot like Peter wanting to build three tents up there on the mountain of transfiguration glory so they could stay up there basking in the glory of Jesus rather than going back down into the valley. Fred just read some words from the Apostle Paul, and before worship, he said, you know, these are kind of hard words to read. You know, it's kind of, and I said, well, that's because they're taken out of Paul's longer argument. And what Paul's talking about in Philippians is he was a man of great accomplishments, and he lists them all in some earlier verses. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Jew of Jews. You know, I'm zealous for God. Man, I had it all. I've got an A-plus resume. And then it picked up with what Fred read, read, read from the Gospels. And he says, you know, once I came to know Christ, all of that just kind of fell away. Not because it wasn't good stuff, but compared to knowing Christ, Paul says, it, it's not worth anything because now my worth is found in Jesus Christ. And then he uses this athletic imagery about pressing forward for the prize, not looking back. He says, I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm going to keep running. I'm going to keep my eye. I'm going to go the right way and not lead people down the other path. And he says it's a marathon. It's not just a little sprint. And this is, again, what Paul says. And think about, think about people running a race. He says, not that I've already attained this, that is the glory of Christ and the resurrection from the dead, or have already reached the goal. I mean, it's still out there. But he says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He says, I don't consider that I've made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The song, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize, became the unofficial anthem of the civil rights movement. The song encourages keeping on, keeping on, even in the face of adversity. And many people have pointed out the scriptural references to our gospel story today and to the epistle lesson that Fred read a few minutes ago about not putting your hand to the plow and looking back, but keeping on. So whether we hear Jesus' summons as a gracious invitation, will you come and follow me? or an imperative, follow me. Jesus waits on our RSVP. And if we say, Lord, I will follow you, then let us keep our eyes on the prize. And the song says, I got my hand on the gospel plow, won't take nothing for my journey now, 
Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. Let us pray. Lord, we want to follow You wherever You lead. Reach out to us this day, stirring our hearts with Your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully be Your disciples. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we pray today, we lift up Dana Myrick, who is going to have hip replacement surgery on Thursday the 25th in Wilmington, and she has asked for our prayers for the surgery and her recovery. We continue to pray for Hill Lanier and his parents. Hill is um, going to be starting some new chemotherapy treatments. We pray for Roy Latiri and Betty as he uh, nears the end of his uh, regimen of chemotherapy treatments and has done well with them. We pray for the people in Texas and other parts of the country who are suffering from the cold weather. I was telling some people the other day, you hear about survivor's guilt, you know, when it was 70 degrees here this past week. It sure was nice, but I sure felt kind of guilty. Um, I talked to my cousin in Dallas, he and his wife, and he said, I don't know why we didn't lose power. Our neighbors did. People two blocks away did. Um, so they were trying to help out their neighbors. But let's keep them in our prayers. Um, we continue to pray for the COVID-19 situation. Let us pray together. Gracious God, Help us to follow in your path of righteousness as we follow Jesus Christ in our lives. Lord, give us the assurance through your Holy Spirit that when we follow him, we will be safe. That when we follow Jesus, all of the hard times in life will not disappear, but that he will see us through Help us to be faithful disciples in our walk. During this Lenten season, Lord, help us to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your will, for your purpose, which is always life. We remember the words of Scripture that encourage us to choose life. We pray that you would help us to do that in a world that's full of suffering and death, not only to choose life just for our own benefit, but to extend it to others in your name. Lord, we pray for Dana as she has surgery on Thursday. Thank you for the kinds of surgeries that, that we have that make people more comfortable and we pray for her recovery in the days and weeks to come. And Lord, we continue to lift up Hill and Denny and Donna. We pray for him as he begins this new regimen of treatments and as he continues with his recovery and his therapy. And Lord, we pray for him as he sets his sight on the prize of graduating with his class in May. We pray that you will give this young man the strength and the encouragement he needs to meet his goal. Lord, we pray for Roy and Betty. Pray for him to have strength as he comes near the end of his treatments. We 
ask you to strengthen him and to comfort him and to be with Betty as she cares for him. Lord, we pray for people of Texas, Mississippi, all other places that have suffered so much during this past week in so many ways. We thank you that power is being restored. We pray for people who are down there helping, for utility crews, for first responders, for disaster relief workers. And we pray for people who are in the paths of winter storms. And Lord, we continue to pray for the COVID-19 situation. We thank you that more and more people are getting vaccinated. We pray that that will make a difference. We pray for people who are still suffering and sick. We pray for people, families that are grieving. We pray for business owners, for doctors and nurses, for teachers and administrators and students, first responders. People have to make difficult decisions that affect many people. Lord, be with them. Give us the wisdom to know how to make it through these hard days. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who calls us to follow him. Lord, help us to follow him every day of our lives. We ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue our worship as we present our tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Holy God, as we start the journey of Lent, give us a will of repentance, a mind of sacrificial love, and a heart of gratitude. Indeed, Lord, you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We offer our gifts and our whole selves, asking that you might strengthen us for the journey. In the name of Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is taken from a declaration of faith of the Presbyterian Church USA, and I invite you to join me in affirming our beliefs. We believe that in the death of Jesus on the cross, God achieved and demonstrated once for all the costly forgiveness of our sins. Jesus Christ is the reconciler between God and the world. He acted on behalf of sinners as one of us, fulfilling the obedience God demands of us, accepting God's condemnation of our sinfulness. In his lonely agony on the cross, Jesus felt forsaken by God and thus experienced hell itself for us. Yet the Son was never more in accord with the Father's will. He was acting on behalf of God, manifesting the Father's love that takes on itself the loneliness, pain, and death that result from our waywardness. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not holding our sins against us. Each of us beholds on the cross the Savior who died in our place so that we may no longer live for ourselves, but for him. In him is our only hope of salvation. Our closing hymn, verses 3 and 5 of Will You Come and Follow Me? As we follow this Lenten path, wherever it takes us and to whomever it takes us, may we follow Jesus Christ and may we go with the blessing of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen.